What an awesome morning it's been so far. <clears throat> if you want to follow along, I encourage you to grab your Bibles. Second John, we're going to be in the book of Second John today. Very small one page letter found in, near the back of the book. I'm going to be reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. Um, the scripture will be on the screen behind me to help follow along, but I encourage you to have your Bible in hand, ready to see what it says and, and the one in your hands. Also want to encourage you to take notes, follow along in the bulletin, however it helps you to stay connected. We're going to, we're going to dive in this morning. The title this morning, Truth Demands Hard Things. Last week, the title as we started Second John was Real Love Requires Truth. Now, to illustrate this a little bit, I thought I'd start off with, a, with an illustration. Um, has anyone ever experienced the thrill of something like a zip line or bungee jumping or something like that? A few of you? All right. So if, if real love were associated in the illustration with the thrill the excitement, the experience of having done a zip line or in the, maybe in the middle of, you know, zipping down that line, the, the air rushing in your face, the, the risk of being so many feet off the ground. That's, if love were related to that, that was our target as Christ's followers, that we want real love, okay? Then we need to understand real love requires truth. And then today as we talk about truth demanding hard things, if you want that thrill, if you want that experience and that excitement of said zip line, what do you have to do? You have to, first of all, look up there and decide, I'm going to do that, right? That, how many of us get past the, step one? <laughs> and then if you're a little bit nervous and you know they strap on that harness real tight, and, and then they put a helmet on you, you know, so in case you fall 50 feet to your you're going to protect that head, you know, and you start thinking through all the things that could happen. This is why they're gearing you up for safety. And then comes the long journey up the stairs, right? You know, especially if they're a little bit wobbly, you know, some 300 pound guy jumps off the top of the tower and, and it shakes the whole tower, and you're going up there going, I was a little nervous to start with. I don't even think I can do this. And then you get to the top. You get to the platform. And the ultimate test of, of truth in that moment is, do I trust that this little cable that's attached to that line above me is going to keep me from falling to my certain death? And is it worth it? Is that risk, is that thrill worth the, the risk of stepping off the edge of that platform? Because you could go all the way up to that point, and I've watched it as, in student ministry and children's ministry, I've watched it so many times, students get to that point, and you know what some of them do? Not going to do it. And down they go. And you know, it's really hard to get a kid to go back up those stairs after they've decided to come down. And I wonder if in our relationship with Christ and in this pursuit of loving one another, loving one another in truth, as, as John speaks about, as it, he's describing the basics of Christianity, church, stay on track with what, what Christ has commanded. This is to love one another in the truth, keeping his commands. I wonder if we, will, we, we start seeing how hard it is along the way and we, we turn back. And that is not what God desires. He wants us to experience the joy of real love. So we're going to read the text. I'm, going to, I'm actually going to be preaching from 7 to the end of the chapter today, but I want to read verses 4 through 10 as we start, because it really was meant to be read all at once, and, and 1 through 3 is the introduction, and 12 and 13 are the closing. Let's hear the body of it together. So I'm going to read that, Second John, verse 4 through 11. 
The Apostle John writes, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth. In keeping with the command we, re- we have received from the Father. So now I ask you, dear lady, not as if I were writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commands. And this is the command, as you have heard it from the beginning, that you walk in love. How many deceivers have gone out into the world? They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. And if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and don't greet him. For the one who greets him shares in his evil works. Would you pray with me as we start the sermon? Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. Thank you for the instruction and the bringing us back to the basics. And Father, I pray we would faithfully continue to grow even in the basics, to love one another, to understand that that keeping your commands involves us loving one another. And if we love you, we'll keep your commands. And so, Father, I pray you would make us a little bit more like you today, that you would give us your heart of love for one another. And God, I pray we would experience the joy of real love. So, Father, I pray you would help me today to speak well, to proclaim the truth accurately and fairly. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would do a work in each of our hearts to prepare us for the message you have for each one of us. I pray we wouldn't despise him. I pray that we wouldn't push him away in what he's speaking to our hearts, but that we would receive your message and faithfully seek to apply it. I pray and I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, like I said, we're going to start out in verse 7, where we pick up where it says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Now, many deceivers have gone out into the world actually misses a word that is written in Greek. The very first word of the sentence is a conjunction. And I know everyone loves English grammar. I know. I tell you what, I love grammar because it helps communicate something. And and it's okay in translation to miss words sometimes. It usually just trying to convey the main idea. And often it's word for word. Sometimes it gets clunky word for word. Nonetheless, this word, this conjunction is the word that would be translated for or because. So he just reminded everybody in the context of the earlier instruction is love one another in the truth. Keep his commands. If you do, you're showing him love. You're loving one another. That's keeping his commands. So, so walk in this truth for or because many deceivers are out in the world. You see, the deceivers that are out in the world are trying to take you off track from the main thing, which would be to love one another. And sometimes that's taking us off track from loving one another in the truth. We love one another, but we ignore the truth. Or, or we go the other way, and we want to be all about the truth, but we stop loving one another. And God intends both for us. So the, we have this beginning. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Deceivers were in the world in John's day, and they're in the world today. A deceiver is someone who leads you to believe something that is not true. When you believe something that is not true, you you live out according to what you believe and therefore walk in some kind of fantasy and not the truth. Have you ever believed something that wasn't true because someone you trusted told you that it was so? Or maybe have you ever just been convinced by somebody who was simply persuasive uh, I think of a, a mattress salesman years ago in my early married life, you know, when I was looking at the mattress that I couldn't afford, and he was like, man, you, just, you know, eight hours a day of sleep, ha ha. A- anyway, uh, eight hours a day of sleep for the average person means one third of your life is spent in the bed, so get a good bed. 
and he talked me into buying a bed I couldn't afford. That one doesn't work on me anymore, by the way. That's, I grew up a little bit. But people don't fall for things that they believe to not be true. Not usually. They usually have to be convinced that what they believe is true. And did you know that Satan comes as an angel of light? Think about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 says, For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. There are people that will claim to be authoritative in the Christian family. And they will proclaim a message that they proclaim is the truth. But Paul goes on in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this is verse 14, he says, And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no great surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will be according to their works. This is what makes deception so difficult is because the message comes along the lines of this is good, this is right, this is what you need to hear, so, so listen up and do these things. This is special knowledge about God that you should know. And you think about an angel of light, it means that that person it would be perceived as an angel sent from God, an angel of light, someone sent from God. If God sends somebody, uh, an angel with a message to somebody, then that person should listen to that message. I mean, think Gabriel Mary, Joseph, who received the message from God through an angel. It was truly God's message. It was the truth. And Satan can disguise himself like he's one of God's messengers. And his servants can disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. So we know that. We need to be aware and alert to that reality. Did, in, in simplicity, did you realize Satan sends missionaries too? When you think about missionary, you think of somebody whose mission is to go out and to evangelize, to, to bring the gospel to the world. But Satan, on the other hand, the enemy of God, has minions, has, has followers, has people that will proclaim something and they'll intentionally spread it across the nations trying to keep people from that real relationship with Christ. He says sometimes false apostles, some disguised even as false apostles. Do you know that even still takes place today? There are people on this planet Earth right now that call themselves apostles. Don't believe it. They claim to have special access to the mind of God and to the power of God, often in some kind of health, wealth, or prosperity message. And the, the power of God is at their discretion rather than God's discretion. They don't usually say it outrightly like that. They might say it like, hey, send me $50 and I'll send you a prayer cloth for blessing to be happening in your life. Be careful of the TV preachers. Be careful of those that are seeking some kind of personal attention rather than glorifying Jesus Christ. It's so dangerous because we could believe that we're obeying God while we're actually walking in deception. We don't want that as Christ followers. So hard thing number one this morning I want to point out is, that, is this, believing that Jesus is fully God and fully man. That's one of the hard ones, okay? It, it, verse seven said, many deceivers have gone out into the world, and here's what they say. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So these people are denying that Jesus is fully man. They're denying that he came. They, they, there is a, a belief that there was a, a new philosophy that was around about this time, kind of early, and it's the roots of what they thought were, you know, not really, never, not, nothing's ever new. But they were saying that Jesus only appeared to take on a physical body. Jesus only appeared to suffer and die on the cross, but he didn't really. And it was in some way a twist to take away from the truth of the gospel. The person of Jesus is fully God and fully man, 100%. And you notice the coming of Jesus listed there is in the present tense rather than the past tense. And I want to remind you that John's writing about 50 plus years after Jesus had been crucified. 
So there's an indication that Jesus actually maintains a fleshly nature of some kind. Remember, he, was, he, he told, uh, was it Mary Magdalene, not to touch him because he hasn't been glorified yet? He, he's in a glorified body in heaven. It, it's, it's fascinating and it's interesting, but they are denying that Jesus is who he says he is. From Jesus' own mouth, from the testimony of prophets and and apostles in scripture. So we need to understand. The, again, these are the basics. And some of you might go, man, I know this. Praise the Lord. Make sure we tell somebody else about it. We've got to continue holding that truth. And it's a matter of faith. Believing that Jesus is fully God and fully man is a matter of faith based on his word. Strong evidence from scripture declares that. Again, Jesus himself declares he is God and man. Many, you know, think about this. Many are willing to call Jesus a prophet. Uh, Jews and Muslims alike will call Jesus a prophet. Others will as well. New age people, people that would look at history and go, well, no, Jesus was a real person. You can't really deny that. More evidence for him than Alexander the Great as a, as a human historical figure. But he was just a prophet, just a good prophet. But they, they don't understand that that really is a message to themselves. If Jesus is a prophet and he's either a true prophet or he is a false prophet right uh, pretty simple on that one if a prophet gives mostly true 90 percent true statements but he gives 10 percent false statements who's going to know which ones are the right ones so if a, if a guy is shown to be false as a prophet he can't be trusted with anything as a prophet jesus declares he's equal with god he declares before Abraham was, I am. Ooh. If, if you call Jesus a prophet, you've got to take him seriously. Or you call him a false prophet. False teaching, any deception that will make less of Jesus in some way is a deception. I, I, you know, it's easy to pick on some of these mainstream ones that everybody knows about, but it, I'll just throw it out there. Mormons, the or LDS, their belief is, oh, Jesus is God. Yeah, sure. But, but by that, they mean that he is a, a child of the father, of, which is God over this planet. And he, he produced offspring, and among which are Jesus and others, oh, including Satan, they bring Jesus and Satan as brothers. And they deny that what took place on the cross was for salvation. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was created by God in heaven. Almost angel-like, the way God had created angels at some point. Jesus is not created. He's fully God, which means he's been around forever. That's what the scriptures declare. And there are others that are lesser known. And anyone that begins to, to take away from who Jesus is, is a deception. So watch out. We can discover who the deceivers are by seeing who makes less of Jesus. John is really reminding the church here in 2 John of what he said in 1 John when he wrote in chapter 4, verse 2 of 1 John, this is how you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. Even now, it is already in the world. The spirit of the Antichrist was already in the world in John's day. Not the person who is the ultimate end of times Antichrist, but the spirit of the Antichrist. So he points out there's been many Antichrists. And John here in 2 John says, when, when he says those that don't confess Christ has come in the flesh, that this is the deceiver and the Antichrist. He's referring to the same thing. And though a future individual end of days kind of... Uh, Catacly well, that's a tough word to say. Cataclysmic, you know, end of tribulation, the tribulation period, that, that Antichrist, 
He's in mind, but John's making a reference to many deceivers who would come in the same spirit attempting to deceive to accomplish the same goal, which is to oppose Christ. To oppose Christ. When we think of the Antichrist, that's what we think of. Someone who claims to be the Savior of the world and totally replacing Jesus and receiving worship that only Jesus deserves. But they oppose in other ways, too. Sometimes it's through taking the place of Christ, but often it's just to lead people off of the truth. Jesus describes the way of truth as a narrow path, and not many find it. But broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that find that one. It's a narrow path to walk in truth, and and once the deceiver can get you off that path. Even if you're just, you know, an inch off the path, you're off the path. So you don't have to think, well, I'm in church and, and I'm doing pretty good because I'm here. Well, I mean, that's a good step, but it doesn't mean that you're not, doesn't mean that you are on the path. I hope it does. I hope this is evidence or fruit of the reality of God in your lives of God in my life. But you could be an inch off and still be totally off. We have to depend upon Christ and Christ alone. So watch out for people that will lead you away from the truth or that have some special message about Christianity that nobody else knows about yet. Just stick with them. Watch out. In fact, that's the primary command here in verse 8. Watch yourselves. That's a little bit East Texas, I think, maybe. Watch yourselves so that you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. It takes work to watch yourselves. We don't like to do that, but this means to be vigilant, to be on the lookout for people that would come in and try to just steer us slightly off the path. Take careful notice of your life and your belief system and be watchful, but don't be fearful. God is faithful, and we have the powerful truth of God's word to keep us on track. Hard thing number two is that it's staying alert to the reality of possible deception. Stay alert for it. Don't, don't put your guard down and think that, well, you know, I'll, I'll even use me. Uh, Pastor Justin has done a pretty okay job teaching scripture so far. I'm speaking from myself here. But I'm just saying, I hope that you felt that, I hope he is, this Justin character has stayed true to scripture, but there's not a point that I want you to drop your guard and just go, everything he says is going to be the truth. I hope you'll expect that everything comes out of my mouth, especially from up here is the truth. But you know what? It's got to be the truth no matter where I am. And if I veer off the path of truth, I need my brothers and sisters. I need our deacons. I need our other pastors to pull me aside and go, bro, off track. And I need to humble myself and get corrected. That happens. So don't drop your guard to anybody Nothing is safe from examination. No one is completely reliable simply because someone says they are. There are some great and reliable teachers, yes. So don't, don't misunderstand me. I point you in the direction of many great teachers and Bible preachers that, that are faithful to the Word of God and to Scripture. But you still have to examine what is said according to God's Word. What are they saying about Jesus? Is Jesus getting the full attention of their message? We have to examine and weigh what is said by God's word. And we can and and definitely need the help of trusted teachers from time to time. So again, don't make less of that or too much less of that. But we have to be on guard. Watch yourselves. John is warning that if you're deceived, you could lose a wonderful reward. That's fascinating. Notice, notice the, the pronouns of this phrase, so that you don't lose what we have worked for. 
That's a strange set of pronouns. You would think he would say so that you don't lose what you have worked for. See, he's not talking about their personal salvation because they never worked for that in the first place. But what the apostles have worked for, these, these men of faith that Jesus trained and sent out into the world, they worked to build the, the foundation of the church, the beginnings of Christianity as we know it. And, and they have worked so that the church would hold true to loving one another, walking in the truth, keeping Christ's commands. We've worked hard for that. Don't lose what that gains you. That's what John is saying. How do you lose what you've worked for? You veer from the truth. So don't lose it. You can lose the joy of your salvation. You can lose the focus on the mission. You can miss out on rewards for faithful service. Colossians 3.24 says, Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. But that you may receive a full reward. I mean, this is not just a partial thing, but God wants to reward you when you enter his presence one day with a full reward. And again, this is something, this reward is an idea of something that you get based on what you deserve, based on what you have earned. So this is not salvation. This is something more than that. It's awesome. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Paul writes, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will be obvious, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, if it's been good work and it survives the test of fire, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And I got thinking about this. You know, we're going to enter glory because we trusted in Christ. But God wants to provide us a rich and wonderful entrance into his kingdom. And I imagine that reward from our creator is going to be amazing. And thinking about that a little bit more and going, you know, what are, my, what are your first thoughts? Maybe yours is like mine, are like mine. Where my first thought is, man, gold, crowns. We talk, man, we crowned some, some awesome people the other night. Can you imagine getting a crown from Jesus? And no, I think there are crowns, that are, the crown of righteousness is one of them for sure that's listed. What about thinking not about material things in heaven, could you imagine, I just imagine, what, to, to have the full, wonderful entrance into heaven, here's one of the things I picture is God welcoming me, going, Justin, welcome. And then he's like, hey, you saints, come, come here, gather around, gather around. Let me tell this is my guy. I love this guy. Man, he went through some stuff, and he held true to the faith. And he's here today by my grace, but look at what, I just, this guy, I'm proud of him. Wouldn't that be cool? And not just for me, but for you. I can't tell you exactly what that reward looks like, but I can tell you that the creator of the universe comes up with some pretty amazing things. He goes on in verse 9 and says, anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. So if you don't remain in Christ's teaching, you don't have God. You know, and so sometimes we have the mindset, well, I'm just being progressive. I've heard people talk about progressive revelation. That God is just, he's just granted us more knowledge now. And there is some truth to that that's built upon the foundation of God's word. But there's also some that progressive revelation that totally disregards what was there to begin with. So we might get outside of the teaching of Christ and, and, and understand if you go outside of it, you're, you're not in Christ. Stay in the content of the teaching of God's word, the scripture the teaching of Christ. 
in its totality. Don't make your home in, in, in this place that is not Christ's teachings because you don't have God. To not have God is a powerful statement. Maybe it means that you've never been born again and you'll enter eternity and suffering for eternity. To have that moment where you enter eternity and stand before God and he says, I never knew you. That's what it's like to not have God. And if we are Christ's followers and we have God, why would we want to live like we don't have God? It's the second time in this short letter that John emphasized the Father and the Son and their relationship. It is of vital importance that we understand that if we have one, we have both. But you can't have one without the other. And so many people will try to separate, make less of Christ and just say, I'm going to hold to God. No. You have the Father and the Son. And the Spirit. But for another time, John isn't talking about the Spirit here in this moment. So here's the practical instruction related to watch yourselves in verse 10. He says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and do not greet him. For the one who greets him shares in his evil works. This is a tough one. And I think the application of this has probably been pretty screwed up by many of us, through uh, many Christians through many centuries. And maybe we, we reject the wrong people into our home that should have come into our home and and we receive people in our home that we shouldn't have, or we greet or support some kind of ministry that shouldn't be. When they talk about greeting someone or offering your support, that's, that's what it's doing. Are you offering support? Are you welcoming this person in a way that says, I support what you're doing? To invite them into your home was like to, to take this fellowship aspect to say come be here in my home and I will support what you're doing and help send you out you almost a base of operation to give it a place to give this person a place to continue with their deception it doesn't mean that we don't ever invite a non-christian into our home in fact I, I strongly encourage that we do part of that Christian hospitality and loving one another, we should be inviting our neighbors, our lost friends into our home so we can share the gospel with them. But if someone is coming and trying to persuade and convince you of something or persuade and convince others of something that is outside of Christ's teachings, then we don't welcome them over and give them hearing for what they have to say. You invite a Mormon into your home or a Jehovah's Witness into your home, share the gospel with them. Don't sit down and listen to their message. Now, there can be conversation. But don't give them that place. Hard thing number three is this, and it's a tough one, not knowingly supporting a false teacher or idea. Maybe nowadays in the world of social media, maybe it's giving a like or a share to a teacher that is a false teacher. Maybe they had something to say that was good or accurate, but by sharing it, we have, we have given our stamp of approval. This is a good guy, good message. And so people go listen into more of what they say because that was good. And then they get the false stuff. We have to be very conscious and careful not to support false teaching or false teachers. These things are necessary to walk in the truth. And it's necessary to walk in the truth so that we can experience real love for one another and for God. And, but in our world, we're supposed to be nice, right? Is everyone supposed to be nice? You can be nice. You can be loving and Christ following. You can be gentle. You can communicate respectfully, but you don't have to support false teaching. Don't assist false teaching. Don't pray for God to bless that person for what they're doing. Pray that God converts their hearts, that he opens their eyes to see the truth. So it's okay to pray for them. Just be careful what you pray for them. Otherwise, we might unintentionally sanction their teaching and their authority to teach it. 
John MacArthur says, sound doctrine must serve as the test of fellowship and the basis of separation between those who profess to be Christians and those who actually are. I'm not talking about people we let in here for worship service. I'm saying, well, this building is open to anyone that would come and want to seek God. But when I'm talking about when, when we are as a church in agreement that Jesus is the only way to be saved. Amen. Jesus is fully God, fully man, and he is worthy of our praise. And the Father is worthy of our praise. And the Spirit is worthy of our praise. The triune God is worthy of our praise. That is who we are as a church. We're Christ followers. So if we allow someone in, though, who begins to say, well, I don't think we should do that. You know, the the Father, Son, they're great, but let's just kind of avoid the Spirit. No. Right? We are are going to be who we are. We we welcome everybody, but if you want to be a part of What he's doing, we submit ourselves to him. And he's not saying no hospitality. In chapter, in John chapter, no, let me rephrase that. In 3 John, the very next letter that he writes, he argues for supporting people who are serving Christ, even if they're strangers. So he he isn't telling us not to support somebody who's sharing the gospel. He's just telling us be careful and discerning of who is speaking the truth. Then he concludes the letter. Verse 12 says, Though I have many things to write to you, I don't want to use paper and ink. Instead, I I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister send you greetings. So he says, farewell. And he says, though there are a lot of things to write about, I've only focused on the basics. I'm not going to put it on pen and papyrus. I guess that not pen either, but what quill and ink and papyrus. But I hope to come to you and talk face to face. Do you want a little bit of a fun one? The actual literal translation, the word that the Greeks used refers to the mouth. So he is saying, literally, I hope to speak with you mouth to mouth. Now, don't get all awkward. This is not American culture. It it just means face to face. That's why it's translated that way. But I want to have the pleasure of being in your presence and have words with you, supporting you, and, and, and having the dialogue of Christian fellowship. Because he says, so that our joy may be complete, so that I can see the work that was applied as having a full effect of people being discipled in the faith, and they're finding more people to disciple in the faith, and they're finding more people to disciple in the faith, and they celebrate in full joy, fulling, fulling? Wow. full on experiencing the thrill of jumping off that platform and getting the thrill of the ride. And he closes. Real love requires truth. Truth demands some hard things. Believe that Jesus is truly both 100% God and 100% man. Stay alert to the possibility of deception day after day. And don't knowingly support someone who is a deceiver. Our Christian unity is dependent on truth and love. May God help us in that. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the instruction and challenge of it. And I know that this is not a complete list of the things that are difficult or hard that are true. Because sometimes the application of these things means that we we lose close friendships, close family members. Sometimes it means that we, we don't do as well economically. But God, you're worth it. I pray that we would depend upon you and be satisfied in the truth. Delighting in the presence of God with us. God, I pray that we would be people of the truth, people who love as this letter so wonderfully and clearly challenges us to do. 
I pray that we would be known for truth and love. May we stand apart from society because your love is so much better than the love this world has to offer. God, we cry out to you in Jesus' name. Amen.